coming up on this episode of Inside the Epicenter. But see, this is the whole essence of what the church is. It's not about one group of people. It's not about one ethnic group. Hmm. It's about all in Christ, Amen. Jew, Gentile, bond, free, male, female, all one in Christ. We're back again. You ever sit in a room like this and you see superstars around and I am just so grateful, Joel, that we're actually able to be here with one of my spiritual superstars, uh, one of my heroes of the faith, uh, John MacArthur. Yeah, so we're in this uh, uh, center, and particularly in a room that you use for podcasting, mm -hmm. uh, that is got uh, ancient, uh, well, maybe not quite ancient, but some of the earliest uh, translations of the Bible you've got. Tell us a little bit about this room, and then we're gonna get into our topic of why did Ben Shapiro <laughs> ask you, of, of any American even chuckle, to sit down and talk to him uh, we're going to get to that in a moment. Just, just describe this room, and, because I think this is a microcosm, this room mm, yeah. of your whole life's work. So this generation of young people, these millennials, pride themselves on their disconnect from history. They pride themselves on the fact that they've arrived on the planet and they, they have an identity that is so isolated from anything in the past or anybody else. And this is what they're, what they're proud about. And it's very hard in that kind of environment to bring the full richness of the past into their lives. So what we want to do, even with the guys that come, this is at the Master Seminary, we, we want them to understand when they step into this seminary, they are stepping into history. They're stepping into a heritage that we didn't invent the church. We didn't invent expository preaching. We didn't invent systematic theology or biblical theology or sound doctrine. We are just the next guys with the baton in the long run toward the final glory of Christ in the end, and we're trying to take the baton to this generation. So we want them to have a sense of history. So we created this room, they call it the MacArthur Center, um, and it's really the Museum of Expositional History. And we'll take some pictures and yeah. post in the show notes yep. yeah. uh, so people can see. So it. on the ceiling are basically reproductions of famous paintings of all great preachers through history, starting with our Lord speaking to the doctors in the temple when he was 12 years old and coming all the way through history so that they understand this is sort of like the cloud of witnesses over their heads. You're taking the baton from some great monumental sort of Mount Everest in church history you have to understand the seriousness, the soberness of that. And surrounding us in this little booth here are the tools of exposition. The ones that I've used through the years, some of the greatest things that have ever been written, like Fox's Book of Martyrs over my left shoulder, an original edition, the first Bible ever printed in Scotland, that's it right there. <laughs> the original King James first edition, and uh, some of the commentaries and some of the writings, some of the uh, old books that these men used, that we just want to put weight on this challenge of being an expositor. And you understand that you, you are in a long line of men who basically not only gave their lives living, but gave their lives, many of them, as martyrs for the sake of proclaiming the Word of God. So this is a sort of a tribute to the history of expositors. And some of the ones who touched my life in special ways, Jim Boyce, yeah. my friend R.C. Sproul, yeah, Dr. Charles Feinberg. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, there's a little picture of me preaching in Calvin's oh, Cathedral. Okay. That was the night that they introduced the French edition of the MacArthur Study Bible, okay. and it was first introduced in Calvin's Cathedral. Wow. And I was <laughs> preaching in his pulpit, and somebody said, it was the first time that someone had preached a message on the authority of Scripture in a hundred years in Calvin's Cathedral. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so there's just a lot of, of sort of history Speaking of here. the great cloud of witnesses, I don't know, of course, exactly how it works in heaven, but you almost have to picture the Lord bringing Calvin over to open up a portal, say, just for a moment, I just want right. you to see that. <laughs> well, you know, if that does happen, Who knows? If, they, yeah, if it does happen, we just want these guys to know these are the ones that are looking down, checking oh, their right. sermons. Right. So this is fascinating to me, and it's I think great. it's an interesting way to begin this particular podcast, because you had a fascinating conversation with one of the leading millennial uh, voices in the United States, mm -hmm. Orthodox Jewish, 
modern Orthodox, Ben Shapiro, uh, not a believer in Jesus as Messiah, respectful of Christians, uh, fascinating voice, uh, commentator of what's going on in our society today. Now, it's not surprising to me that a leading um, conservative or, you know, or just media voice would want to talk to a leading American evangelical, but that tends to happen because they want to talk about politics. Mm -hmm. If a person chooses you to put on their program, <laughs> you know, you're very Googleable. <laughs> you're going to know what you're going to get. No, there's no mystery. Get. No, there's no right. mystery. No mystery. Right. Look, yeah. you, you're, book, you're not literally. here to talk about Donald Trump and Joe Biden. You're not here to talk about the politics. You're here to talk about the Bible, about Jesus, about the gospel. You do it lovingly and winsomely, but you can't sit with you and not have that conversation. So <laughs> if you're Jewish, or at least whatever your faith or lack of faith, if somebody invites you on the program, they just need to know what they're going to get. And I, right. it, it'd be impossible to think you did. So Ben Shapiro, I love Ben and I don't know him personally. I've been on the program. Talk about how that got started. How did he, what literally happened that he invited you to have you on the program? And then let's get into the, why do you think that happened? And then we'll get into the actual conversation. What happened is that his entire Daily Wire is not far from here. Okay. So I was cheap. <laughs> they didn't move. They, but, they, didn't, uh, they moved to Nashville and now. Regulations yeah. and so forth. Yeah, but no, I mean, not only, not only <laughs> are they cheap. close here, okay. but there were number of people who worked at the Daily Wire who came to Grace Church. Okay. That played a, a part in it because there were times when they said, we've talked to Ben and we wish he'd have you. Mm -hmm. So I think there was some personal connections mm -hmm. at that level. But yeah, no, he had to get past the reality that, that he was going to go into the lion's den in a certain sense because he was going to hear things from me that he didn't believe. Uh, and Which he was again, gonna, is, it, it, you know, Larry King in right. his day would have Dennis Billy Graham Prager. on. Yeah. He, did, well, he had Larry me King, on so many times. Yeah, okay, too. there you go. Yeah. But that's a little bit different from a, a kippa wearing no. Orthodox Jewish uh, right. man because then you're getting into the most sensitive Larry point of tension. Larry King, by his own confession, was, was an agnostic. Yes. Yeah. But Ben was a true believer in, yeah. in Judaism. But anyway, the, the bottom line, I think, is what he said to me after the conversation. Okay. He said, you cannot know how refreshing it is to talk to someone about the Bible mm -hmm. who actually knows what's in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So he said, I'm weary of having conversations about the Bible with people who claim to know the Bible and don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. I think the common ground, I think what Ben saw in a conversation with me was that from the standpoint of ethics, and morality, and virtue, and honesty, and truthfulness, and character, the Old Testament and the New Testament taught the same thing. Mm -hmm. And that was the common ground. And that's what he focused on at the beginning of the conversation. You know, he, he, would, he would say things like, you, you know, when it comes to life and all of that, we believe the same things. Well, of course we do, because we have the same God in the Old Testament that we have in the New Testament, he's not going to change his character. Yes, and I just want to make a point here because I have great respect for Ben. You know, obviously we wouldn't agree on probably on every issue and certainly not theologically, but common ground in our culture today is not enough for most people. If you are come from a tribe, politically, no, no, uh, I understand. philosophically, it's like a betrayal to talk to someone and have a respectful, interesting conversation and be friendly about it, even if you disagree. I'm finding that opportunity with major Muslim leaders, but some on my own evangelical tribe, like, how could you do that? Because they are open to having a conversation. I believe in that, but uh, I'm no, glad no, that you a, do, a, that he did. It's an astute observation that the, people are defining themselves narrower and narrower and narrower all the time. And when you talk about common ground, it's almost offensive to people. Right. Particularly if you say you're an evangelical, how would you find common ground with a Jew. Well, that's the first thing you look for, <laughs> yes. right? I mean, the Apostle Paul, when he wanted to get to the gospel with Gentiles, he went to creation. He talked about the creator because everybody has to understand that you, if you have an effect, you have to have a cause, at least every rational person. <laughs> but whenever he talked to the Jews, he talked from scripture. So I knew that there was one point of common ground. And that was that what God said in the Old Testament, Ben 
confessed to believe. Yes, amen. He confessed to believe. So, Which is not true of every American Jew or so, every Jewish person. So I might have abandoned right. the scriptures. I just took sad. Paul and the, and the Ethiopians thing, and I just said, okay, let's go to Isaiah 53. And what amazed me was that for 20 minutes, and that's a long time, and I'm, I'm like this far from his <laughs> face, and 20 minutes, and he doesn't move, and he doesn't say anything, and... You know, it's a kind of a frightening thing to talk to him because he's so smart and he's so fast. He's very fast. And you don't know, you know, what's coming. And so it's like an Alzheimer test, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> but secondly, you're just saying, Lord, you know, you know how that works when you're having a conversation. You pick a direction and you go and that's what you do. And, mm -hmm. But um, no, I loved the conversation. He was so respectful. Um, I felt... My respect for him which was already there, but it grew in part because this point about, you know, sometimes you're on with an interviewer, you've been on with so many over the years, and they're really not interested in your point. No. They're interested in making their point, and they just want you to say yes or no, oh, or, you know, I'm you're there absolutely for... Absolutely right. But he, on his own show, norm, you know, he's telling you what he thinks, and he kept the same principle with you. I actually want to know what you think. Yeah. I may or not agree with you, but I, I will just make your case. I think what makes <laughs> Ben so effective is his confidence. Mm. He knows what he believes. You're not going to knock him off his feet. You're not going to confuse him. You're not going to even convince him, probably. I mean, he's locked down on what he believes, and the security of that yeah. makes him open. But my only prayer was, Lord, all I can do is give him the truth. And then I gave him the book that I wrote on the gospel according to God, which is on Isaiah 53. It's been translated into Hebrew. <laughs> And it's over in Israel. They gave it to the some of the. It was first distributed among the military in Israel. But anyway, Isaiah 53 is pretty hard to swallow if you're trying to reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Uh, and so that's where I went. And he was respectful. He loved the conversation. I think there was a connection in the, in the friendship side of things. And if we had the opportunity, I mean, his desire and mine both was to spend more time together. But then COVID came and then yeah. they well, headed we for Tennessee. To days. I, you know, I think that something you brought up right there just always resonates with me, that we have lost the uh, capacity, it seems, in so many evangelical circles to be people who respect other views. And to hear you say, you know, he was respectful, it's wonderful, it's a great testimony. But I think your ability to step onto his ground and be respectful, um, I think... Maybe common ground is a dying place. Maybe it's a smaller, well, it feels smaller like a, place. But. Too many people generally, but even evangelicals, have treated common ground as a capitulation mm -hmm. of truth. Mm -hmm. That if I'm not trying to go for the jugular and the win, yeah. meaning right. salvation, a conversion right at the table, that somehow anything else, yeah. a conversation sort of yeah. wishy-washy and, you know... Well, and I so, think that can, that can happen, sure. right? So here, this is one of the issues, I think, Joel, that leads to that. We have a lot of canned gospel presentations. You know, th this is what you do, this is what you say. You throw the law in their face, and then you ask them four questions about the law when they don't, when they say, I don't, you know, you, you bind them by the law, and then you offer them Jesus. You go in, you go in with this prescribed approach. You can't find that in the Bible. Every gospel conversation in the Bible starts at a different point yeah. and goes down a different path. It's your ability to, to find that common ground. Mm -hmm. It's your ability to stand together and walk together. Mm -hmm. Two can't possibly walk together unless they're agreed. So if you're going to get to a destination, you've got to find a pathway of agreement. At some point, you come to the fork in the road. But we have oversimplified the gospel presentation so that some people can only get to the gospel one way. Mm -hmm. And we've also caused people to have um, almost a cantankerous attitude toward people who don't believe what they believe. Right, that's right. And that kind of thing is completely contrary to the attitude that we need to have in speaking the truth in love. So love says... I need to find a way to this man's mind and this man's heart by affirming. And even when he asked me about the president and some political questions, I knew I was saying what he 
would have said, or something close to what he would have said. I mean, I because I agree with him on so much. Yeah. I don't have any trouble finding common ground with, with Ben Shapiro. <laughs> My goodness, even politically and economically and yeah. uh, even on a moral level and just a common sense level, I can listen to the guy and say, I, I don't know that I've found very many things, if any, that I would disagree substantially with him on. So I think we have to approach people with that common ground in view and then at some particular point, you know, we, we get to the crux of the issue, which I did when I gave him Isaiah 53, and then it's in the hands of the Lord. Yeah. Well, this goes to the, another point, which is I think that there's a sense from many, too many, I don't, can't quantify it, but that conversations with people who don't believe are one-shot opportunities to get as much of the gospel message as rapidly as possible and then sort of insist on a decision and then if they say no or if they're offended because you're doing too much well that's the stumbling stone of the gospel uh, maybe <laughs> or maybe you're not interested in having a friendship that could take years to a person you know I, I think that's different Jesus saying in Acts chapter 1 you will be my witnesses mm -hmm. witnesses you can be a witness and not be asked every question that is, you know, ever been asked in the first moment on this on the witness stand. You know, some of that is just a relational thing. And Jewish people, I would just say, feel so defensive about the Crusades, about the Inquisition, about most Jews are not rejecting the actual gospel because they haven't heard it. What they're rejecting is Christian Jewish no, relations, of which has either been you don't count, God's done with you, <laughs> or you count and I want to insist that you believe what I believe yeah. right this minute. And nobody wants that. I, yeah. I you know it, it, well, we well, tend me, to not respond well with what's called contact evangelism or uh, it would right. tend to be relational and we are curious well, look, I mean, we're being loved. Look, Joel, that is life. I've been a pastor for 53 <laughs> years. If I have been for 53 years insisting on everybody around me believing what I believe, I wouldn't have been here a year. <laughs> I mean, you, well, my, maybe my, you do insist, but you don't insist that day no, that they but, hear you. <laughs> well, no, you have, even with the people in this church from the day I came here, half a century, more than half a century ago, my goal, just with anybody, is to find the common ground, to approach them somewhere where we can begin to have a friendship, where we can agree and even if I'm talking to a believer who's got issues in his life and needs help, I want to start where we walk together for a while, and that's how you survive half a century with the same people. <laughs> well, amen. Hi, this is Joel Rosenberg. There is nothing more powerful than prayer. We serve a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. So if you would, take a moment right now and pray for our many partners across the epicenter. Many of them regularly face persecution, harassment, and many, many difficulties. And your prayer could make a tremendous difference in the war against evils that face them. We know how the story ends. Let's pray to that end together. Well, I think this common ground theme is, is so rich and so important for discussing Israel and her neighbors, right? Because Christians, Jews, and Arabs in the land of Israel, they have centuries, millennia of frictional places. And finding common places of morality or discussion, it's so crucial. It's actually essential to what we do at the Joshua Fund because we seek to bless Israel and the neighboring countries in the name of Jesus. You, you put those things together and you have to work with a common ground mentality or it's like throwing gasoline into a fire. You know, the, the, the potential for explosion in that sort of mix is always great. I know, especially with Jews and Muslims, right? I, I know you Most always say, explosive. don't say explosive growth, but you know, we see the gospel going forward in ways that is not explosive in the sense that it's conversational and it's conversional. It's really common ground finding. I remember when Paul spoke at uh, Mars Hill? Three reactions. Acceptance, this guy's a crazy person, a babbler, or hey, we'll hear more about this. Let's hear more. How could you hear more unless you find a place to have that conversation? But see, this is the whole essence of what the church is. 
It's not about one group of people. It's not about one ethnic group. Mm. It's about all in Christ, yeah. Jew, Gentile, bond, free, male, female, all one in Christ. Because you understand that to bring somebody from Israel to the knowledge of Jesus Christ is not all that you're interested in. It's just the focus of your life. The fact that I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church doesn't mean I don't care about the people some other place. I mean, that kind of narrow thinking uh, is pretty rare. I think we all understand the body of Christ is made up of all people, tribes, tongues, and nations, and that's the picture you have in heaven in the book of Revelation. And the fact that you focus on Israel in this kind of political climate may bring some scorn on you as if you're isolated, but but I know full well your heart, mm. and I know that you have no narrow view of evangelism. Mm. You understand that the world is to be brought to the knowledge of the gospel mm. so that people can be saved from all nations, and that's what God is doing. Traveling to Israel, but also becoming an actual citizen and trying to put my roots down there, my wife and my kids and two of our sons serving in the army, really caused me to spend more time thinking about what does unconditional love mean and what does it look like? Because unconditional love means, you know, we talk about in the Joshua Fund context, we, we remind people that in Israel there's actually a law. You can't, like, open a soup kitchen and invite, you know, drug addicts and prostitutes and homeless people in and say, okay, sit down, we're going to share the gospel with you, and then you can have soup. That's very American, but that's not, you, it's illegal in Israel. You can't do something that's, that looks like you're exchanging a material good with proselytization or mm -hmm. you know, sharing the gospel in our case. And nor should you. In my, I, I'm not saying that in America that's wrong, but I'm saying Israelis, Jews, and Arabs and Muslims are so sensitive to this issue that it, it actually is useful to us. We believe the law is right, which is we are just here in the areas of our yep. dis food distribution area. With, we do it through the local churches. And, and the idea is we're doing it because we should care for people. Mm -hmm. people. It's not that we're doing social gospel and not the gospel, but we don't want someone to think you're only important to us if you say yes to something and then you go down this road. Jesus didn't feed the 5,000 men and plus the women and children and say, you only get your food no, if no, you stand in this line and you say yes. Of course he wanted everyone to believe. But this is just one of these things, you know, the, the 10 lepers, right? He healed them all. Only one came back to worship him. And only after he, he was shown that level of love. So I'm trying to ask myself and my team and our colleagues, how can we truly love people because they're worthy in God's eyes to be loved? Yes, we want something. We want them to at least hear. One of the books I loved that you wrote dealt with this issue. If really with Paul speaking to the Corinthian church saying, I'm not here to use all kinds of fancy language or tricks. In fact, whatever oratorical skills he had, he was trying to get rid of. Right. I'm just presenting the gospel in the power of the spirit. And I want you to believe if it's true, not because Paul was a great preacher. And you make the point there that the churches sometimes try to do all kinds of drama and, and sometimes literally or circuses I think you use at one point and people mm -hmm. trying to do all these things rather than believing that just love someone tell them the gospel mm -hmm. and the word will work you don't have to do all kinds of crazy things I think that book is titled ashamed of the gospel ashamed mm -hmm. of the gospel yeah, yeah. not and ashamed of the gospel yeah yeah, yeah. and you hate yeah. to even say that the church could be so ashamed of the gospel that it would try to trick people, try mm -hmm. to fool people, try to soft sell, take out all the offensive part of the gospel. But that's exactly what's happened. And, and pragmatism right. has produced that. Yeah. And the pragmatic churches today are disastrous, really disastrous to the testimony of Christianity because they're full of unconverted people who are there for their own self aggrandizement, um, self-promotion, self-satisfaction. They have very little to do with Christ. And so you have this large uh, volume of people who go to an evangelical church and claim to be Christians who don't know Christ at all. Mm -hmm. They cause immense confusion. 
in terms of what is a real Christian and what is a real church. Yeah. So, yeah. And it really helped me think a lot about what were my convictions and then th- realizing that when I look at how the church treats Israel, you have these categories, a lot of which are unhealthy. <laughs> you either have people who are like, God's done with the Israel and the Jewish people and they're supersessionists or in some category they're replacement theologians. But you have others who absolutely love Israel and they will do cartwheels and backflips and but don't worry we're never going to tell you about Jesus because we just want to support you politically and I don't find either of those helpful no (laughs) Uh, because I don't want to stand before the Jewish Messiah one day and say hey I stood with my people politically or or I rejected them I don't want either of those but I do think this issue of Romans 1.16 and the issue of being ashamed of the gospel, either for the Jew or the Gentile, is a problem that a lot of pastors or even lay people, but I, think, I see it at the higher levels, struggle with. How do I love a, a nation and a people genuinely, genuinely, and want for them to know Jesus, but not be trying to shove something down people's throats? Uh, we had a situation in Israel just recently, these ultra-Orthodox family living in an ultra orthodox neighborhood were outed as missionaries. Now, I don't know the real truth of that hmm. situation, mm-hmm. John, but I will say nobody in their community knew they believed in Jesus. So let's say they were missionaries for a moment. <laughs> what in the world are we talking about to be deceptive, <laughs> to sort of dress up as an orthodox Jew, to convince everyone that you are an orthodox Jew, ultra orthodox, and to have nobody around you for decades know that you love Jesus and then be outed as a missionary what are you doing? What's the point of that? I don't even understand. Yeah. But some people do weird things. Yeah, I think... I don't understand it. I, I don't think we need to make this thing complicated. We're born again by the word of truth. We're not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew and to the Greek. So to be ashamed of the gospel is to cut yourself off from the very power that saves So boldness with the gospel is required. It is necessary. You can't be ashamed. On the positive side, Paul says, I'm a debtor. I mean, I owe them that. I owe them, Jew or Gentile, I owe them the truthful explanation of the gospel. But I think that's always going to be framed in what we've been talking about. Because everywhere Paul goes, the the approach he takes is different. And it's all based on some connection, some way to connect with people. And even backing to to the ministry of Jesus, Jesus connected with people before he ever said anything by touching human life at the profoundest need. And that was physical suffering. He healed people. He could have jumped off buildings. He could have cartwheeled. He could have created trees. He could have created animals in the air. He could have done all kinds of things to demonstrate divine power. But what he did was demonstrate the compassion of God. And it it wasn't always tied to a gospel lecture. It just wasn't. And um, I think you see that in Jesus through his whole ministry. And in the end, you know, when they crucified him, it was an amazing rejection of not only the message of salvation, but this massive act of compassion that had gone on for three years, and they, they called him a blasphemer. So you do all that you can do, and it, you, in the end, they, they may not accept it, but I think that was the Lord's approach, and I think you have to see that in the New Testament in the book of Acts as well, because the apostles go out, and what do they do? They go to the temple, but they heal somebody, and they had that same power because it was so important to undergird this radical message with compassion at the level that most people would feel it the most, and that is in physical and human suffering. So I I think if Christianity thinks that bright lights and rock and roll are going to take the place of compassion and love and kindness and tender mercies toward people, they're absolutely deceived. Mm -hmm. And and it goes to this, uh, at the core, I think where your confidence comes from is the word works, and God Absolutely. has a plan. That's what, going tying back to our earlier conversation. I mean, not everyone listening to this is going to be a Calvinist. I get that, but your view from the scriptures is: if God has a plan for someone to come into the kingdom, I don't know that about them because I'm just 
meeting them. So you, you, you sort of acting as though you don't know what God sovereignly wants to do in this particular person or family's life, but you are making sure that they know that they're loved and that they're uh, befriended. And because of love, you want them to know the truth of the gospel. And then the seed of that word is either going to work or it isn't. Right. That's you, not because you're manipulating, that you're right. lying, that you're deceiving, you're trying to sneak into some community, or you're baiting them with, here's some food, if you'll do this. It's not, here's some candy, if you'll say yes. And I think and that's th- important. To, yeah, that comes that's from a way the oversimplifying message. the gospel. Yeah. Way, because the motivation to receive the gospel is not tied to something you get. It's tied to repentance. Mm. So you, you eventually you have to get there. Mm-hmm. And I think you have to get there in a way that touches the heart. You've got to get there not in a way that you poor, wretched, law-breaking sinner, you're on your way to hell. I mean, that's just so blatant. I mean, there's a time and a place for preaching in that sense. But I think that reality has to be communicated with compassion and love uh, from your heart to the to the individual so I, I I think at that point you trust not in your method you trust in the truth the gospel is the power of salvation you're begotten by the word the truth Peter says so it's got to be biblical and it's got to be gospel and that does the work then it's oh, in the hands of the Holy Spirit. I feel like I've sat in a graduate seminar oh, for the last I, I hour. This is well, amazing. Carl, we, we are needing to wrap up, unfortunately, but do you want to wrap up with any last questions or sure. comments on your own part? You know, it's, uh, it does draw around this issue of Israel and what the Scripture says. And, you know, what would you say today to your congregation about where Israel is now? I mean, a lot has changed in the last 10 years since you talked to Joel and, and things are happening. But where would you see that? Well, first of all, uh, I think it is an incredible, almost unparalleled apologetic for the truthfulness of Scripture. (laughs) Because not only does Israel look exactly like you would expect them to look in the plan of God, they're in the land. They're back in the land. There's a movement of the gospel there. There's a bit of openness that there wasn't in the past. The Word of God has made entrance. They're translating evangelical books. They're translating the MacArthur Study Bible into Hebrew, even though... The end must be near, John. (laughs) Yeah. And then you look on the bigger side and you say, and the book of Revelation pictures this global, one-world dominating power that literally can cancel you, so that if you don't have this mark, you're out of existence. You... And then you read an article about digital identity, and all of a sudden you see it one day and it's off the internet the next day, so you know it's true. Once you get a digital identity, and that's how you buy food, and that's how you get your bank account, and that's how you get medication, and that's how you purchase anything, and they turn you off, you're canceled. That sounds like Revelation 13, exactly. So I I would just say in the big sense of things, everything, everything is in the place that would appear to fit the scenario of the book of Revelation with the realization that the church is raptured prior to the outbreak of all of that. So we got to be near the rapture of the church. Well, I hope so. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, I've had I'm enough. Excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I feel like Paul. I, there's more to do. So yeah. if God will give us the strength and the energy mm-hmm. to, to be a blessing to those who don't know Jesus in the Middle East, as well as to strengthen and encourage the, 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 the church to fulfill the Great Commission. That's and, our And heart. keep this in mind, and I, I, this is Maybe ha- end this helpful point. for people to remember. The kingdom advances one soul at a time. Mm-hmm. It's not national conversion. Mm-hmm. It's not tribal conversion. It's not even family conversion. It's one soul at a time that the kingdom advances. And so we need to find ways, personally, to proclaim the gospel to Jewish people, not just in Israel, but anywhere and everywhere, as well as anyone else. To Muslims, to That's right. yeah, yeah. To atheists, to agnostics, yeah, That's a, it's quite a challenge. Well, it's been quite an amazing conversation. John, thank you so much. No, Joel, pleasure. thank you. Yeah, no, it's an honor. What, what a thank blessing. You. With you. Yeah. yeah. And thanks to everyone listening. We feel like this has been 
an intimate conversation with John MacArthur, and we're very, very grateful for the time that you've spent with us. So God bless you. Amen.